All right, everybody. Before we begin, I want to offer a special prayer for the people in the path of Milton tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you on behalf of all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe we have family down in Florida. Maybe there's friends that have moved there, Lord. Several from our church have moved there. And Father, this doesn't look good, but you are on the throne, and we pray for a miracle. We pray, Lord, that you would miraculously pull the plug in this thing, that it would just drop like uh, nobody can figure out. And the wind speed, Lord, would come way down. And that, Lord, you would protect those who are planning on riding it out, that you would be uh, their shield. Protecting them, Lord, guiding them through this thing safely. Uh, and Lord, I, we just pray that it doesn't be the storm they're predicting with all this 12, 15 foot storm surge, Lord. Uh, Father, just please work a miracle of preservation uh, for those down there that they would survive this storm. And to those along with the victims of Helene, that you would get them supplies and food, water. Uh, shelters, all the necessities, Lord. And um, we just pray that you would work in the hearts of all your people, Lord, because it sounds like you're, seems like you're trying to get our attention. And we just pray that we would humble ourselves before you seek your face, pray, turn from our wicked ways, that you would hear our prayers from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal this land. We ask you now to please bless this study for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, can I have you turn to the book of Romans, chapter 7? So we are in the third major section of the book of Romans, a section that we're calling sanctification. It runs from chapters 6 through 8, and each chapter has a theme. Chapter 6, the theme is the sin nature, the sin nature. Chapter 7 is the law, and chapter 8 it's the spirit, as in Holy Spirit. We are currently in chapter 7, the section dealing with the law. And last time we looked at verses 1 to 6, a section we called the authority of the law. And tonight we begin um, the second section of chapter 7, what we're calling the ministry of the law, runs from verses 7 through 13. Now, guys, Paul has been building up to an explanation of the purpose of the law since chapter 3, really. In fact, in chapters 3 to 5, he taught us that the law can't save us. In chapter 6, we learned that the law can't make us holy or victorious. In chapter 7, we're going to learn that the law can't deliver us from sin's power. Now, Paul was the master of anticipating what people were thinking especially the Jewish people reading this letter. And at this point, no doubt, Paul is thinking that those in his Jewish audience who are reading this letter might be prone to say something along these lines. If the law can't save us, if it can't make us holy, if it can't free us from the power of sin to control us, if it stirs up all kinds of evil desires and brings forth fruit to death, verse 5, then what value is the law? It seems that you're saying, Paul, the law is evil. Now, Paul anticipates this and uh, argument, and in verse 7 he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Or in other words, is the law evil? But then he quickly responds, Certainly not. The Greek is megenata, very strong. Uh, Absolutely no way, no how kind of a thing. And then in this section, from verses 7 to 13, he defends the law and gives us his true purpose. He says that God gave the law for really five reasons. And some of these we've already covered, so we're not going to spend a lot of time with them. But Paul tells us in this section, verses 7 to 13, that God gave the law for five reasons. For revelation, inflammation, condemnation, exaltation, and then verse 13 for conviction. All right, verse 7, God gave the law for revelation. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, certainly not. On the contrary, 
I would have not known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness under the law, excuse me, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, if we follow his train of thought, we can understand why some would infer from what Paul has said that, you know, he's, in, he's saying that the law is, is evil. It's sin. But Paul, Because Paul has just gotten done saying in verses 5 and 6, For when we were in the flesh, unbelievers, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So again, it sounds as though Paul is putting the law down, that he's saying the law is bad. So that's why he starts off verse 7 by saying, well, what should we say then? In the light of all that I've just said, is the law sin? Is it, is it bad? Is it evil? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. And then he moves from there to say, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now keep that in mind. It's going to be pivotal to what he's going to say from this point on through the rest of chapter 7. First and foremost, Paul is telling us that God gave the law to reveal sin. We've said it before. Let me say it again. The law is like a mirror. You look at your face in a mirror, it can show you the dirt on your face. It cannot cleanse that dirt. The law was never intended to cleanse us of our sin, just to reveal our sin. And that's what Paul is saying. Now listen, some scholars suggest that Paul's own personal revelation of his own sinfulness may have taken place about the time of his bar mitzvah, when he became a son of the law. That's what bar mitzvah means in Hebrew, a son of the law. When a young Jewish boy became 13, he was considered a man. And now he was a son of the law in the sense that he was now responsible to keep the law just like all the other adult men and women in Israel. So it was a coming of age thing. A big deal in uh, Israel back in those days and still today, obviously. Um, but around that time, a lot of scholars believe, and this is what they would typically do. Uh, when a young man was, uh, was about to make his bar mitzvah, he would enter into a time of reflection. I mean, this was a big thing. You were, you were coming of age. You were uh, be, uh, going to be considered a man very soon when you were bar mitzvah. And now it was your responsibility to take the law seriously. You know, no more living under mom and dad's authority kind of a thing. You now were responsible before God Almighty to keep the law yourself. And so they would typically enter into a time of reflection. Um, how have they been doing with the law up until this point? Have they been taking it seriously as of this point in my life? Already have I been taking the law seriously? And so they would typically spend a lot of time reflecting. And in particular, on the Ten Commandments. Uh, that would have been customary. And uh, no doubt Paul, a serious-minded young guy, I'm sure, serious-minded adult, no doubt serious-minded, you know, son of a Pharisee, grew up to be a Pharisee, uh, very serious about the law were the Pharisees. And they were not all hypocrites. A lot of them were, but there were men like uh, Nicodemus and Paul uh, and many, many others that were very serious about their religion, about uh, their relationship with God and the law and keeping the law, okay? And so as Paul was reflecting, he no doubt found that he did pretty well as he reflected on the Ten Commandments. That is, until he came to the Tenth Commandment. Now, I'll read it to you. This is out of Exodus 20, verse 17, where God said, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. To covet means to lust after. To lust, to strongly desire, we would say, to lust after, okay? God is saying, you shall not lust after your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And as Paul began to reflect, and this is what a lot of the scholars believe, a lot of the commentators know. As Paul began to uh, reflect on this, he began to realize something about the law he had never seen before. The first nine commandments dealt with outward actions, 
outward actions. Let me read them to you. Where God said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a carved image of anything to bow down and worship it. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Guys, all of these outward commandments Paul had been faithful to keep. And that gave him the impression, the illusion, really, that he was a righteous man. But when he came to the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. Paul realized that this commandment didn't deal with the outward actions of a person's life, but the inward attitudes of a person's heart. And in his mind, as he grappled with this concept, many believe he began to see that his heart had that his heart was filled with coveting. He had lusted many times in his heart over all kinds of different things. And so, because of that, even though he had considered himself a righteous man his whole life, for the first time he began to see himself as a sinner. That's what a lot of the theologians and uh, scholars believe. Uh, That was the process, the the journey that Paul went through to, to get from thinking himself a righteous man to a sinner. I mean, as one who had kept the law outwardly, but had broken it many times inwardly in his heart, it's beginning to dawn on him that he was not a righteous man. He was a lawbreaker. And this is, of course, exactly what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Why don't you turn to it? Matthew 5. You know it, but let's just read it couple of things, not the whole Sermon on the Mount, of course, <laughs> but uh, I want to just pick out a couple of passages out of Matthew 5, because Jesus taught on this, obviously. Matthew 5, verse 20, verses 21 and 2, uh, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And Jesus is doing the very thing that Paul came to the realization of. He's talking about how that, for many years, the Jewish people thought that the law was all outward. It was all about keeping outward commandments. And if I never murdered anybody, I was good. Didn't matter if I hated a person in my heart. See, I wasn't committing any outward sin. And so they kind of excused that, the attitudes of the heart. But Jesus, no, no, God sees the heart. All sin begins in the heart. And so that's why Jesus said, no, it's not enough not, just not to murder somebody. If you hate them in your heart, in the eyes of God, you've murdered them already. Look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old. Now, these are all the teachings of the rabbis and the Pharisees. They've been teaching this stuff for years. And Jesus is correcting it. He's setting the record straight. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart, as seen by the, in the eyes of God, right? Now, guys, I personally believe that this realization didn't come at Paul's bar mitzvah. That's my conviction. But sometime after his Damascus Road experience is recorded in Acts 9, probably during the three days of blindness he endured in verse 9 of Acts 9, okay? Before that, Paul goes on to tell us in Philippians chapter 3, before that, he thought of himself as a very righteous man, even even when he was helping to persecute and kill Christians. This is how deceived we can be, where we can take something sinful, wicked, and so turn it around it sounds noble and virtuous. Paul really thought he was doing, and Jesus said that in Luke in uh, John 16. He said to his disciples, there's coming a time when those who kill you will actually think they're serving God. Well, Paul was the short-term fulfillment of that. What was the long-term fulfillment? Islam. 
other religions that persecute the Jewish people, thinking that to wipe out Israel is to serve whatever God they worship. It's interesting that Paul actually thought himself very righteous even as he was uh, helping to kill Christians. You don't have to turn to it, but Philippians 3, verse 6, listen. Concerning zeal. Now he's talking about how, look, you guys think I'm against the law? You know, because he had his detractors. He had his people that, you know, well, Paul, he never cared for the law. I never cared for the law. What are you, crazy? And he, he runs through his testimony. You know, he gives his, um, the resume, okay? He said, verse 6, concerning zeal, <laughs> I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he connects persecuting Christians with being blameless with regard to the law, because that's his mindset, right? It wasn't until God really began to work in Paul's life by using the very law that he thought was making him righteous to be the instrument to reveal his sinfulness that caused him to begin to see the true purpose of the law. And that's what he's talking about in chapter 7. He's giving his testimony. And again, this is one of the main purposes of God giving the law in the first place, to reveal our sin, not to make us righteous, but to show us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We've read Romans 3, verse 20 numerous times through the course of our study in Romans. But Paul said, Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. Nobody is ever going to get saved by keeping the law. All right? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Not the way of righteousness, the knowledge of sin. That will then point you to Jesus for true righteousness. One author put it this way, he said, and I quote, The law is like an x-ray machine. It reveals plainly what might have always been there but was hidden before. You can't blame an x-ray for what it exposes, end quote. Well, it's true, right? Sin was always there. It wasn't like the law created the sin in our heart. It just exposed it for what it was. And so, guys, first of all, the purpose of the law was revelation, verse 7. It revealed our sin. Number two, it was for inflammation. No, I, you say, i got to hear this. Inflammation. Now, we've already talked about this a couple of times already in our study. I'm not going to belabor it. But let me just say this. The law not only reveals sin, it inflames sin within us. It stirs it up and makes it come alive. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead, or in other words, it lay dormant, is the idea. Notice that Paul doesn't actually say that the law, listen, produces all manner of evil desire. He says that sin, again, the sin nature, uses the law of God to stir up these evil desires. Look, what God intended for good, Satan uses for evil. I mean, the law is good. We're going to see that in verse 12. The law is good. But my sin nature takes advantage of the law of God and uses it as a catalyst to stir up evil desires, which I then often give in to. Look at verse 8 again. But sin taking what? Opportunity by the commandment. The word opportunity in verse 8 is a Greek word that means a military base of operations. A military base of operations. In other words, Paul is telling us that our fallen sin nature actually uses the law of God as its base of operations. Can you see? The imagery is pretty stark, okay? He's telling us that our fallen sin nature actually uses the law of God as its base of operations from which to launch its evil offenses against the will of God for our lives. Guys, the law makes demands in the form of commands. But when the law commands us not to do something, it becomes, listen, a call to action for our flesh. It stimulates our rebellious hearts to do the very thing God has told us not to do. Proverbs 9, verse 17 
Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. What is it about? You know, for some people, food doesn't taste as good unless it's stolen. You know? Or, or, or whatever, fill the bike, right? I want you to look at verses 8 and 9 again. Romans 7, 8 and 9. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, at this point, one commentator offers a helpful paraphrase that might kind of shed some light on what Paul is saying. He, he said, and I quote, He's paraphrasing, okay, verses 8 and 9. But sin, setting up a base of operations through the commandment not to covet, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead or dormant. And I was alive, blissfully indifferent to the searching demands of the law. But when the commandment not to covet came, sin sprang to life and I felt the sentence of death. Uh, one commentator uh, seeks to shed some light on what Paul is saying uh, with this. He said, and I quote, uh, Here's an illustration of this principle from the life of Augustine. In his confessions, he tells of a time in his youth when he and a group of his friends went into a neighbor's field at night to steal pears. They shook the neighbor's pear tree, knocking down a large quantity of pears, then carried them off, eating a few but throwing most of them to the pigs. Why did Augustine steal the pears? Was it the beauty of the pears? They were beautiful, the author says. I mean, it's true, but uh, since they were a part of God's creation, but uh, that was not why he stole them. He had others even uh, of even greater beauty at home. Was it because he was hungry and needed something to eat? Well, that wasn't it. He threw most of them to the pigs. Was it peer pressure? That was part of it, uh, he says, but not the real reason. Finally, he admits, Augustine did, I picked them simply in order to become a thief. It was for the pleasure of acting against the law, of doing something that was forbidden. The desire to steal was awakened simply by the prohibition of stealing, end quote. Kent Hughes used to be the senior pastor of a college church in Wheaton. Um, he said in his commentary on Romans, he said, I recall being in Boston several years ago and walking south on the common toward the gardens uh, with its beautifully manicured lawns and flowers with a pond and swans and boats. There were signs everywhere which read, Keep off the grass. However, literally hundreds of people were lying on the grass and hanging their clothes on the signs. It is pleasurable to lie on forbidden grass, end quote. Someone else put it this way, he said, and I quote, Can you imagine what would happen if one of the stores in your town painted this sign on their window? You are forbidden to throw stones through this window. That window wouldn't last 24 hours, end quote. Guys, the law doesn't stop sin. It only inflames the desire to commit sin. That's Paul's point. Number three, God gave the law for condemnation. Look at, uh, let me just say this. Um, the law not only reveals and inflames sin, it also condemns the sinner. Verse 10. And the commandment, which was to bring life. Now he's talking about the commandments of God, the law which he had put his trust in for many years to get him into heaven, make him righteous. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. How did sin, using the law, deceive Paul? The Greek word means to lead astray. How did the law lead Paul astray? Well, by leading him to expect life from his keeping of the law, when what he found was that the law only brought him death. Condemnation is the idea, in hell. Uh, 
it, the law didn't um, make him righteous. It just declared his guilt for breaking the law, which was condemnation that would send him to hell eventually. The law misled him in that regard, gave him the impression that by keeping it, it would he would have eternal life. But at one point he found out nothing, it was doing nothing but condemning him and by convincing him that he was acceptable to God because of his own goodness, hard work, religious zeal, and so on. Now, guys, I don't know if most of those who read these verses really know what Paul is saying here. I know you guys do because we've been studying it here and in Sunday morning in Galatians. But I'm talking about people in general who pick up the Bible, maybe look, read the book of Romans, come to this section. I don't know if most of those who read these verses really understand what Paul is saying here. If they did, they would realize that they are two of the most troubling verses in the Bible. These verses are telling us that the vast majority of people who think they're on the right road are actually on the wrong road. They think they're on the road that leads to heaven when in fact they're on the Broadway that's taking them right to hell. And they don't even realize it. Of course, we read about that in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, the Broadway and the narrow way, right? But they're on a road that is causing them to think. Religion is a um, deception. It gives you the illusion. This is what Paul is saying. I was deceived. I thought this system of keeping laws and commandments was actually bringing me righteousness and eternal life. I was completely taken in, deceived, misled. It was putting me on the road that was causing me to think that my religious devotion was bringing me closer to God in heaven, when in reality it was condemning me to hell. I didn't even realize that Paul was saying, and most religious, religious people don't either. Praise the Lord that Paul came to realize this before it was too late. While there was still time to change course, while there was still time to abandon all of his religious works, which he was looking at or looking to, that uh, he believed were making him righteous in God's eyes. Thank God God gave him time. God worked in his heart. God opened his eyes that he came to see that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, the only way to God. Um, and that by faith, putting his faith in Jesus, God was offering him the gift of eternal life, not a reward for his hard work. Look at Philippians 3. Because again, Paul's talking about his testimony. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 9. After he had gotten done telling them how zealous he was for the law, uh, you know, born, you know, of the tribe of, of uh, Benjamin, uh, circumcised the eighth day, uh, son of a Pharisee who, I, who became a Pharisee and so on, zealous for the law. He goes on to say, but what, verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. So all those religious works that I'd done all those years, put my faith in all of that to get me to heaven, when I realized they weren't saving me, they were condemning me, he said, I turned my back on all of that. I, I, you know, I walked away. Uh, I counted them all loss for Christ. Verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Unfortunately, guys, many religious people won't come to that realization until after they die, and then it's going to be too late. Look at Matthew 7. Of course, you all know it, but Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? 
cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, guys, we've talked about this before, but these are not the irreligious, atheists, agnostics. These are the very religious. The fact that they call, address him, Lord, Lord, uh, it's emphatic. It implies they're shocked. They, I know you, we know you as Lord. What do you mean we're not going, getting into heaven? They, they can't believe it. So these are church folks, okay? Church folks. Now, when he says in verse 22 that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, then I'm going to say to them, I, I never knew you. So a lot of people that read that and go, well, how could these people not be saved? They're prophesying, casting out demons, working miracles. Look, they think they're doing those things, or they did those things on earth. Jesus never confirms that they actually did those things. They thought they did. How many Word of Faith ministries have you guys ever seen on TV? Those guys think they're casting out demons and working miracles every day. And maybe some of them actually believe they are. I think a lot of them are just charlatans who are just lying to make money off the people of God. So don't let that throw you. It's very obvious that he said, to, when he said to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, okay? I never knew you. When we talked through this section a few weeks ago, we said, look, in um, verses 15 to 20, um, Jesus warns against the danger of false prophets. A lot of people go to hell because they sat under the teaching of some teacher, some prophet of God who lied to them, taught, gave them false doctrine. But then he moves from the danger of false prophets to the danger of false professions. And this is where self-deception comes into play. This is what Jesus Christ was saying here. And guys, religious people are the most susceptible to religious deception because they're already open. They're already open to the spiritual. And Jesus is warning us, look, it's wonderful that you have a heart that wants to believe. Make sure you believe the right things. Because a lot of folks are going to say to me on the day of judgment, but Lord, we, we believed in you. We went to church. We were involved in ministry. But he sees the heart and says, I never knew you. You were not in it for me. You were in it for you. Whatever that means. Again, people go to church for all kinds of reasons. They want to get to know people and make friends and have a group to belong to. Sometimes they want to network or they have a business. They want to sell products and services. You know, you get the idea. Sometimes it's just recognition. I want to uh, find my calling in the church and just let people know how spiritual I am. There's a lot of reasons why people go to church that is not really for the Lord. They use the Lord. They use Jesus, right? But self-deception is a major problem in a lot of people's lives. And on the Day of Judgment... Jesus is going to say to them, you deceived yourself. You, you practiced lawlessness. What does that mean? You didn't really read my word and keep my word. And the word would have set you free from, the truth would have set you free from this deception. But you didn't really pursue the truth. You gave it lip service is the idea. But this idea of um, people uh, thinking that they're right with God, righteous when they're not. Uh, we see it all over the place. But I, I thought one author uh, gave a very powerful illustration of this truth from a true story. A true story. He said, and I quote, Sometimes people will maintain their innocence with regard to sin by saying, huh, I really don't sin. Uh, I sometimes tell little white lies and commit other innocent mistakes. It's always a mistake. Uh, commit other innocent mistakes, but I, I really don't sin. Surely nothing that God would send me to hell for. Then the authors give a, an illustration. He said, you know, driving through a rural, this is a true story, driving through a rural section of Pennsylvania, a man crossed a wooden bridge where he saw a, uh, a young boy fishing. 
Hey, son, he called out, fish biting? No, answered the boy, but the worms sure are. <laughs> the stranger chuckled and kept on driving. About five miles later, he stopped at a gas station and asked if there was any good fishing spots in the vicinity. Sure, answered the attendant. There's a great spot just about five miles up the road uh, that you just came from, about, f about r right around where the bridge is, the bridge you crossed. He said, oh, I know about that one, he said, uh, answered the traveler. I saw a kid there, and he said the fish weren't biting, but the worms were. The two men chuckled together until a look of horror came over the gas, attendant's, gas station attendant's face. He dropped the hose, ran to his car, and raced down the road toward the bridge. When he got there, he found the little boy on the edge of the riverbank dead. You see, after his initial chuckle, the attendant suddenly realized that the worms, quote-unquote, the boy had been playing with were actually baby rattlesnakes, which are every bit as venomous as their adult counterparts. And the author says, and so it is with many people today who are playing with sins they think are cute or interesting or fun. They feel that because they're not robbing banks or murdering people, the sins are small and harmless. Yet they don't realize that in the eyes of God, they are every bit as deadly as their larger counterparts, end quote. You don't have to turn to it, but of course, we remember what John said in Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, yeah, we would say, well, yeah, well, they actually deserve to go to hell. That's the context. They're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. We would read that list and go, well, yeah, I, I can see why they would be sent to hell. Then he says, and all liars. Whoops. And I don't see him making an exception for white lies either. All liars. See, we have a, my Catholic background actually taught us this. But I think for people in general, uh, you know, who have grown up in our country, uh, in Catholicism we were taught that there are mortal and venial sins, you know, and if you stay away from the mortal sins because they're going to condemn you to hell, uh, God kind of looks the other way with a lot of the venial stuff, a lot of the minor stuff. But the Bible says there are no minor sins. There are no minor sins. And we deceive, our, deceive ourselves into thinking, if I don't murder and rob banks and commit adultery or whatever, well, it's a little white lie. God's way too busy running the universe to worry about me with a little white lie or that I'm taking a few things from work uh, here and there. That's a deadly deception. That if you stay away from the big sins, God seems to indulge you with all the little ones. In our culture, people don't want to talk about sin anymore, do they? They don't want to talk about sin. In fact, many today refuse to acknowledge the concept of sin at all. I remember, I re, excuse me, I remember reading this several years ago. I've kept it. It goes like this. And I quote, When he was nearing the end of his illustrious career, Dr. Carl Menninger, the brilliant psychiatrist and founder of the famous Menninger Clinic, wrote one final book in which he appraised the psychiatric health of the nation. It was originally published in 1973, and it was called Whatever Became of Sin. As a psychiatrist, what disturbed him and caused him to write the book was an awareness based on his careful observation and counseling that the concept of sin has all but disappeared from our national conscience with disastrous results. Menninger defines sin as transgression of the law of God, disobedience of the divine will, moral failure. Sin is failure to realize in conduct and character the moral ideal at least as fully as possible under the existing circumstances. Failure to do as one ought to uh, failure to do as one ought towards one's fellow man. End quote. So he obviously understands the law. He was a Jewish, and um, I don't know if he was a, a, a saved man, but he understood what the law in Judaism, Judaism was all about. And he rightly said, look, I work with people all day long, I see people, who think that sin is not sin. However they define it, uh, you, it's getting harder and harder to find somebody that says, yeah, I'm a sinner. 
That was wrong. I violated what God said. I was wrong. It was sin. The manager says, I, it's whatever happened to sin. In our, this is back in 73. Whatever became of sin? That's his question. Well, guys, we know that for the most part, sin has been redefined as a sickness. Think about that. A sickness from which you don't listen, repent, you recover. Psychiatrist Thomas Sass, one of the great masters in the field of psychiatry, in his book, The Myth of, the Myth of Psychotherapy, he was one of the masters, okay, points out that through the acceptance of psychotherapy, he said, and I quote, we have turned the salvation of sinful souls into the, into the cure of sick minds. The so-called experts, quote-unquote, have also redefined the acts of sin. Adultery? Well, that's just having an affair. Homosexuality is not evil, it's just an alternative lifestyle. Drunkenness is alcoholism, a social disease. Pride is having a healthy self-image. And lying, as someone has suggested, is simply the result of an extrovert with an active imagination. Wow. Boy, they can really spin it, can't they? I'm dizzy. As a result, these so-called experts, and good heavens, what, what did we ever do before the experts showed up? How do we ever survive? How do we get from day to day without some expert telling us how to live? Right? Half of them, half of them, most of them, don't know how to live themselves. But the experts, so-called, have removed responsibility from people for their actions. Uh, Menninger refers to this in his book by a satire about psychiatry written and sung by a lady named Anna Russell. I thought this was kind of comical. Um, here's how it goes. Now, this is a, it's a parody on psychiatry, okay? This whole profession that, you know, basically tells people, you're not a sinner, you know, you're, you're just a victim. <laughs> goes like this. At three, I had a feeling of ambivalence toward my brother's. And so it follows naturally, I poison all my lovers. But now I'm happy I have learned the lessons this has taught. That everything I do that's wrong is somebody else's fault. <laughs> now think about that. That sums up our society in a nutshell. Today we're seeing more and more quote-unquote victims seeking revenge, Right? The alarming result of a psychologized society where people are constantly being fed a steady diet of everything they do wrong is really not their fault. They're a victim. Well, as somebody said, the inevitable result is, is going to be that at some point they're going to want to strike back at the society that has hurt them. The idea goes like this, the mentality. People have hurt me. Now I'm going to hurt people. And boy, we see that everywhere, right? And it's all traced back, I believe, very, it's pretty obvious, it's all traced back to this idea that, you know what, there's no such thing as sin. You're not really wrong, you're a victim. No matter what you do. I, I can't believe how some people have turned the things that they have done in their life in such a way that they really think they're the victims. Like the guy... I heard about a, a few years ago who kidnapped this young gal. He put her in this dungeon kind of a thing. She was chained and everything else, and he would rape her every day. I don't know how long this went on. But finally, over the course of time, she kind of acted like she was for him and tried and got on his good side, made him think that she was, you know, this was something she wanted too. He lowered his guard and she escaped one day. Went to the authorities, he arrested the guy. On TV, he says, well, he's actually the victim. I thought, well, there you go. Wow. If a guy like this can spin what he did to make himself look like the victim, anybody could do it. Anybody could do it. So we'll leave it there, guys. We'll pick it up next week, God willing, um, with number four on the list of why God gave the law. We'll move then into uh, chapter seven a little deeper. But let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that, well, you used the law, you used a lot of different things to bring us to Jesus. 
And Lord, looking back at the life we once lived, and many of us thought we were good people. Not perfect, but good enough to get into heaven, I think. But thank you, Lord, that you opened our eyes to the truth. In time for us to change course. In time time for us to fall on our faces and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. I don't deserve anything. But you paid the price, and you are offering me salvation as a free gift. I receive it. I thank you for it. And I turn my whole life over to you to be my living Lord and Savior now every single day. Thank you, Lord. Give us grace to uh, be patient and kind with those who are still being deceived by the devil in the area of religion. They mean well. They feel they have a relationship with you. Open their eyes that they would see what Paul saw. That religion wasn't making him righteous. It was condemning him to hell. And we thank you, Lord, and pray again for the those in the path of Hurricane Milton, Lord, pr- please protect them, save them physically, save them spiritually. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.